any any question for me uh, till the have you understood overall business analysis process we had a look at six knowledge areas right uh, just to revise it quickly and this is a pmi standard you know methodology the way uh, they normally depict this uh, knowledge area and we basically try to understand why are these things so what are six the six steps which a typical analyst address one is uh, you know business analysis and planning we had a look at you know uh, a detail uh, um, stuff how we do in terms of input output right so ba planning and monitoring uh, we have uh, needs want non performance performance objectives we create uh, we normally work on five tasks and there are five outputs so we normally try to create a business analyst approach for me and my team uh, stakeholder engagement approach who are the stakeholder their list positions best time to call best to to interact and all those things then i govern my approach i also build information management approach i have also bit business analysis performance assessment which will go through the long term as organization policies and procedures this is our first knowledge area if you move to the second knowledge area we have elicitation uh, and uh, collaboration input output so here we normally we uh, start with uh, again same thing needs want business analysis information stakeholder engagement approach which we created in knowledge one we try to build a business <coughs> analysis performance assessment where we try to uh, build uh, our and our uh, you know <coughs> colleagues uh, performance benchmarking so that who is doing what how he is doing what should be the you know <coughs> speed efficiency and what's the best way so try to understand uh, adopt to the best practices of the industry right the outputs here are elicitation activity how we are converting the vision mission of a client to requirement and to functionality elicitation results unconfirmed there are elicitation results the visions can go to back burner so we might not include in our current development phase um, current product approach or current support services scope but still they are mentioned there in the document as an unconfirmed elicitation results and elicitation confirm are basically convert to the requirements and then to the functionality business analysis information communicated so all normally all communications are recorded kept archived as an business analysis information communication track so that anybody can refer to these auditory facts auditory facts are normally documentation audio video clips whichever we col collected and even client supplied materials whenever we archive this thing on a the cloud these are called business analysis information in totality that's the archival folder we normally rename to and then stakeholder engagement so we update this stakeholder engagement day on day out so whenever i spoke to a client he might refer to a new executive like you know i am talking to state farm office in sengwis sometimes somebody might refer to a officer in you know tampa florida sometimes an um, the officer can refer to me somebody who is working in let's say california militas or india or something like that so so those all stakeholder engagement uh, additions normally i also mention in my stakeholder engagement list right then i move to the third knowledge area which is requirement life cycle management here i normally manage the requirement life cycle and the outputs are requirement traced uh, design traced so there are two crucial points here i do track and you know um, build a traceability amongst requirement and build a traceability amongst design now design is specifically for software or like say architecture purpose but normally designs can be an optional things in most of the scenario but we normally do capture requirements as an requirement traceability matrix right which basically is a list of requirement where you started you know um, conceiving the requirement where you started to basically give a finite picture to the requirement build it more uh, depth get the clarity build con uh, conciseness and then evolve it to functionalities that's how we do step by step now this functionality are normally shared with the development team product team or support team so they can start constructing they can start building those product they can start supporting or uh, you know planning those business uh, support services for the client and this is how the step by step evolution of the whole you know business analyst uh, you know, work culture have been designed as a best practices by the able 
okay and again i'll request you to go through the ba book so you'll understand each and every nook and corner of these ba processes right and then we have strategic planning strategic analysis how we do in terms of a long term planning like the planning which is after 6 months so here we are trying to learn best best practices we are trying to adapt the best industry practices so that i can cope up with the speed efficiency of the industry i might use utilize some good tools which are, which are available in the industry right and we discuss the those thing in the now from today onwards we are going to learn these tools step by step okay then we have the outputs like where we stand in terms of current status of a project current state of overall the engagement the business requirements what were those in terms of strategic um, you know initiatives these are normally something like enhance the hr system so these are strategic business requirement we are talking about business objectives there were probably you know issues in current business manual attendance process so we have upgraded it to a centralized um 24 by 7 um uniform um attendance management system and something like that so these are all long term business objectives we are talking about and that's why client is spending money right so this is a kind of business alignment we have so whatever requirement we create they are aligned with these business objectives and we check normally if they are aligned or not and then we can decide the priorities and scenario in collaboration with the product owner right so far so good anybody have any question for me at this moment no thank you okay great i believe you understanding the way i explain if not please do ask questions okay then the last knowledge area requirement analysis and design definition so here sorry um, but one not last one this is a fifth one right so here we are trying to understand requirement analysis and design definition we normally building something we are normally improving something these are the two things we do as a business analyst and we build the initial planning we build the initial concept for that right so for that what you do you normally collect the requirement we normally specify and model the requirement from the vision convert it to a functionality and give it to the development team so this knowledge area talks about all these uh, you know conversions from a vision to a functionality <clears throat> here the output expected Uh, from the business analyst is basically requirement specified and model so this is what we call system requirement specification document that's what we collect and it includes all the thing srs is owned by business analyst or business analyst teams we normally collect our requirements and include it in here it can be uh, you know starting from a typical voice voice file but we normally don't include voice file in the word document so we have a list of requirement <clears throat> which i have created in excel sheet or a text format or you know mom minutes of meeting action item i can just copy it from there and paste it in my document then requirements verify so all these requirements whenever i collected uh whenever i reviewed with a client whenever he appro approved i normally jot down those time date time, stamp and the stakeholders name positions and approval remarks as well right and there are a couple of the uh, other uh, supporting documents also normally updated uh, requirement traceability matrix as well as stakeholder engagement right and then all these requirements which are validated is it in line with whatever system we are thinking so if we are improving the attendance management system are we going to improve the attendance in the library also is it included is it not depends on client right if client is ready to pay for those you know uh, extra biometric or iris scan or whatever we are implementing i'll include that thing because the incremental cost is the least in terms of every every it solution typically for others it might vary so this kind of scenario i normally validate those requirements <clears throat> if i think of additionals right and then we build a requirement architecture here we are talking about conceptual architecture are we architect no are we designer no we are analyst so we analyze the vision to a requirement and to a functionality list this functionality list normally is a kind of bible or a reference material for a product development solution development or support development right this is what we do so everything what we do is in align with these best practices right and then we might choose some design options <clears throat> we try to build auditory fact through various tools and techniques what are design options we opted for 
and what not. If whatever you have updated, you normally try to implement in a tool uh, like you know we have many various tools for depicting uh, options correctness. These are like fishbone diagram, SWOT analysis, and you know there are a number of them. These are normally selected by the uh, development partner. Like if you are working with Infosys, Infosys normally work with uh, you know SWOT analysis. They also work with Excel based uh, data researching. So that whatever you research in terms of data, it can be as simple as iris scanner from Philips is at hundred dollar, iris scanner from Sony is four hundred dollars. So that's why I'm going with the Philips. Does it yield in the market? Uh, if people are purchasing Sony, then why they are purchasing Sony iris scanner? I'll jot down a couple of you know uh, analysis available on the net, and I might include the ref reference of that website. Saying this Sony scanner can really <clears throat> scan light blue eyes very well than um, you know Philips iris scanner and so on and so forth. These type of results are normally available on the website. If not, you might be do a bit of research on your own as well. And that's what we do. We do analysis, we do research. So that's why there are quite a few organizations. Data analysis are normally progress to data scientists because we do research. We do find best possible options, best possible solution for a given requirement we are collecting. And that's how the important career progression for a business analyst is a data scientist. In many organizations, they are referred as a data scientist as well. Even if you're doing analysis job, you are trying kind of adding value to the whole business. And that's how they normally refer to you as a data scientist. And these things do happen, believe me, practically as well. Okay. And then last, uh, but um, uh, last and one of the most important knowledge area is solution evolution input and output diagram. <clears throat> this solution evolution is one of the most crucial in terms of enhancing any product. <clears throat> like we are talking about, we are enhancing a attendance management system. So there was an attendance management system before, which we are enhancing to a level where it is not go, uh, now going to go 24 by 7, universal, um, on the mobile, on the cloud, and blah, 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 things. So we are enhancing the product. So we normally do a kind of gap analysis. Where I stand right now, where I'm going to go at the end of the day, at the end of that resolution, um, sorry, at the end of the solution definition and implementation, right? So in that scenario, we normally build this, you know, solution performance measures. So where am I looking at? What am I looking at? What are the things I need to improve, right? Do I need to also integrate with the other softwares? Like we talked about library management solution, uh, like SAP and so on and so forth, right? So we try to basically build a solution performance analysis, solution integration, you know, environmental factors, solution limitations, even enterprise limitations. Are they ready to pay that much? Because you can suggest all sort of, uh, you know, best suitable uh, uh, solutions to them, but they should have enough pockets. They should have enough uh, economic, uh, you know, support to uh, take the uh, solutions to the latest technology. Sometimes latest technology can be in multiples of, uh, you know, uh, cost. So we might choose a basically economical alternative and this thing do happen. And for that, we normally, <clears throat> work on an excel sheet we try to build some alternative uh, uh, which is a kind of median of cost and performance uh, and we depict these alternatives on our excel sheet so that we can share these solutions uh, we can share these auditory facts with the clients right and then we basically uh, recommend actions why not this why not that and even you'll include all the stakeholders details saying uh, this is the stakeholder who discussed uh, um, in detail on terms of choosing these alternative and we have chosen why we have chosen these alternative and uh, you know so on and so forth so we collect all the auditory necessity the auditory artifact and necessities why we chosen that option does that make sense anybody thinks uh, we are doing too much or anybody thinks we are really exaggerating the simple analysis process are you like um, yeah please go ahead sir I'm sorry. No, I think it's fine right now. So far. Sure, sure. Even uh, anytime if you feel I am, you know, uh, we are really kind of uh, doing this process uh, with too much efforts, please speak up so that I can uh, explain you why it's a need and how this process is matured as well. I'm doing business analysis since I was a project manager and this was in 2003. So it's almost um, like 18 odd years. 
So, you know, I can answer all your question in terms of why and why not analysis, those kind of scenarios. In good old days, we used to really work with the um, uh, project manager being a business analyst. And that's how we basically improved our step-by-step -step process, improved our, you know, included these process into the project management and improved our project management templatization and so on and so forth. We'll have a look at analysis uh, whenever we are doing the project management also. It's, a, it's in a smaller format. I have shared one, you know, um, screen with you in terms of how PMI thinks on uh, business analysts, right? And it's uh, more or less in line with the BA. Uh, where was that? Yes. Uh, the knowledge area. Yes, uh, this is from a PMI side. Uh, and let me go ahead uh, and, you know, so we talk about uh, business analysis, the whole thing. So we uh, get oriented, discover primary business objective, define scope. So there's a scope statement, there's a formulate plan, there's a BA plan, there's a defined detailed requirement. This is the older, you know, process uh, format of business analysis. Support technical implementation, help the business implement solution, Act, uh, you know, assesses the value created by the solution. Then we go into detailed business analysis, regulation and best practices. So please do refer to IIBA website whenever you feel I need to improve my BA policies and processor, uh, processes as per the current market state. We have seen this, like how we add value to a project. Sometimes business analysts uh, normally have a couple of project managers also report to them. And this is how the senior most business analysts do. We normally, uh, support project product or you know uh, services definition uh, we convert the vision to a strategy requirement and then build a solution or conceptualize the solution to a level where development team can basically go on building that solution on their own this is how overall ba role was used to be because we were kind of uh, included in a project management knowledge area so ba was uh, ba roles and responsibility was kind of part and parcel of the project managers. Now they have created a separate team because there were too many failures in terms of project management, uh, trying to do the business analyst activity, something like that. So, so we have improved the business analysis as a knowledge area and we've created it as a separate knowledge area, separate execution task for all BAs. Uh, and we normally have a separate, you know, knowledge area input output diagrams for us so that we can really create uh, independent business analysis output than the project management and which can be given to the product management team, support and services team or a project or solution management team. There are many organizations where we have these scores as a separate team. They might report to something called project management office and that's how it happens. And we normally refer to project management office as a <coughs> PMO. In normal sense, uh, in a political sense, PMO can be also referred as uh, prime minister's office. But in project management, PMO means uh, project management office, which is a kind of uh, group of several very senior people among the organizations, including CIO, CTOs, and you know various other uh, older um, uh, or you know matured executives among the organizations who direct all these project management body, product management body, and service management body to excel into their uh, you know, governance. How do they do it? They, they try to basically help you in building strategic goal, building, uh, you know, cost cutting measures, building, improving efficiency with, uh, you know, certain tools. So, so they also basically support us if BA is doing uh, research on something like internal organization upliftment. So these are normally, you know, initiatives taken by an organization and they assign some BA to some internal improvement also. So how do we do it? Let's find out if Zoom is more suitable or Google Meet is more suitable for our organizationalized infosys and build some, you know, pros and cons. Why we should choose Zoom, why we should choose, you know, uh, uh, Google Meet and so on and so forth. Have I started recording? Let me check. Yeah, I've started recording. So here, what we do, we normally try to give even business better alternatives in terms of tools, policies and procedures. So these are uh, internal BAs, right? So you work for improvement uh, um, of your organizations day in, day out. So these are also type of BA, uh, which normally helps organizations to improve one by uh, improve the policies and procedures, right? Now we had a look at business analysis core concept model, which is given in depth in terms uh, 
uh, in terms of uh, BA book. And this is really <clears throat> good uh, analysis uh, to convert the complete BA process as a uh, separate entity within organizations. And that's how we have make it uh, a kind of really crucial, uh, we have addressed really crucial point in terms of understanding the vision to convert it to a requirement, to convert it to a functionalities or solution, and then hand it over to the technology team. And we normally share all the artifacts, whatever we collected throughout this process, right? Now let's try to uh, classify these uh, you know, requirements we collect, because this is a kind of output generated by business analysts, right? So we should know our output or what we are supposed to deliver to the whole company, right? And that's why we are get paid for at the you know end of the day. So whatever you do as an output, let's try to understand how the category is in understood by the businesses. Okay, let's take step by step. There are some business requirements. So these are the requirements which normally support the business. So um, you are making the business more efficient, more you know economical, uh, more uh, to the given uh, uh, adopting to the given scenario. That's how we build business requirement. This describes high level needs of an organization as a whole, such as business issue or opportunities and reason why a project has been undertaken. Like in, uh, in our normal you know, example, standard example, we think about enhancing attendance management system of, our office, uh, uh, of the offices of State Farm across the globe, right? So for that, the business requirement can be enhancing attendance management to remove all the pitfalls, errors, leakages, and all those things, and make it more sturdy, uniform, 24 by seven. And you can actually uh, check it out, any attendance throughout the, uh, any offices on the, right? And that's how this business requirement have been shaped up, shaped up by analysis like us. We document these in something called SRS, system requirement specification. Also collect the auditory fact, who discuss these, when you discuss these, and step by step, how you improve this, uh, you know, requirement gathering to a level where we understand in depth if these are validated and verified requirement. And now these are functional uh, specifications can be shared with uh, development team so that they can start building the product. They can start building the solution. They are start building the services if at all required in this whole solution space. Then there are something called stakeholder requirements. These describes the various wish list, uh, various you know uh, additional scope measures to a given solution. Whenever you are discussing with uh, any executive at State Farm for their understanding of the solutions and their uh, you know view of how we can improve these solutions, right? So uh, they can give you a couple of wish lists where we normally include all their wish list in our uh, you know stakeholder discussions minutes of meeting. We might or might not include in a solution, depending upon the vastness, the cost incurred and all those things. We normally validate these requirements with the critical stakeholder like the product owner and the you know um, important approval authorities so that we will decide if we need to include this thing in our current scope or not. So even BA defines scope most of the time. So whatever scope the development team is going to build normally comes from the BA team, the business analyst team. Then we have solution requirement. We understand the vision, we convert it to a requirement and then to a functionality. And that's the most critical process we do, right? These describe the feature, functions, characteristics of the product, service, or a solution result, right? Whatever we're going to build. And that will meet the business stakeholder requirement. Solution requirements are further grouped into functional and non-functional requirement. Functional requirement is like, I want to get the attendance system enhanced. I want to do it uh, like, no, I can give up to maximum 30 seconds for um, gathering the total attendance from a typical resource. Now let's try to understand this performance requirement. Performance requirement basically are time barred. So when I say I need to have one page or one form to be filled within so many minutes by the applicant. So something like that sort. So whenever we devise something like attendance management solution, where we are gathering the attendance of a typical, you know, um, employee, uh, guest or what not, right? So in that scenario, there should be a performance parameter attached to it. Now these are called non-functional requirements. So whenever Ravindra enters to the state form office in St. Louis, his attendance should be over within 30 seconds. 
and these are you know valid um, requirement right so how do we achieve it i'll make sure <clears throat> these uh, biometric scanner retina scanner what not are placed at a really strategic location wherever i mean the industry office he'll just put his eyes uh, you know across the scanner and walk away and that simple his eyes putting to the uh, given uh, iris scanner can collect all the details needed by the attendance management system he can um, the system can identify ravindra pandey uh, they can match his old iris to the new iris uh, you know whatever iris scan on that day the system can know, uh, note the time and uh, you know date wherever ravindra have you know uh, scanned his iris in the morning or you know uh, whenever he are incoming in the office and so on and so forth so like this i'll make sure his attendance is marked within 30 uh, seconds or less normally it's done in 4 or 5 seconds but normally walking in you know putting his eye in case if that you know iris scanner was foggy and all you might need to wipe it with a you know um, um, tissue or something so adding all these floor as and fauna uh, we can set a time limit on performance of all such activities and that's how we do as a business analyst so does that business analyst job is easier no well we collect requirement we understand the region that's kind of simple english linguistic we are talking about but whenever you collect these requirement you validate you authorize them you get it get them approved you convert to your to, to a technical language and these are the complete you know understanding of a collecting requirement so if somebody says it's really easy i'll not say i'll not 100% sure it's really easy once you start doing it it will be kind of you know practice for you but to start with we need to understand this process and that's what we are doing right now so we categorize the process into six steps called six knowledge area now we are categorizing what type of requirements we collect right so there are functional and non functional requirements functional requirements describes the behavior of a product what functionality the product should support like it should take the attendance it should display the you know attendance record to hr executive it it should basically mark the leaves if he is not he or she is not coming right so in this way we normally collect the requirements and validate the requirements and categorize the requirement also so there are functional requirement as a behavior of a product these includes actions processes data interaction that the product should execute so whenever i say attendance management marking it's a interaction between an employee with the system right and this is a simple uh, you know process you just put your uh, you know thumb index finger or what finger you have already recorded to a biometric scanner or put your eye left or right whatever you have decided uh, to the iris scanner and iris scanner scanner will mark your attendance there is a problem here if you have said uh, my right thumb is um, my you know identity uh, description and if you put left thumb the system won't accept because system don't know what are your other fingers are and so on and so forth we need to make sure if anybody puts different finger we should notify him with a sound like uh, alarm or let them know um, not an employee or something like that sir so that they know okay i might have used the wrong finger something like that or wrong eye for iris scanner so this way we also build some validation authorizations and system exceptions within the functional requirement will um, got we will start working on the tools as of today and we'll go through the different tools and techniques we use to make sure we mark these requirements in a concise way in a complete way and that's what we do we also understand the background behind the requirement and keep validating those requirements to a level where even the stakeholders can understand in depth we might build some training slides we might train them as well and that's how business analysts are attached with the product project solution or services throughout the life of a product project or solutions and that's the importance of the ba job ba job is one of the most critical job for a given product solution or support because we understand the requirement so whatever is not aligned with the requirement it's not aligned with the requirement it's not validated by the client or it's not fit in the business uh, you know basic business alignment of a product solution should we add it should we shouldn't we well we discuss with the client we discuss with the product owner and decide because every requirement have a cost attached to it normally so for that all these cost have to be validated verified and then only we can give a conceptual solution 
um, a finite picture, right? And also how we build the solution scope, we're going to learn via tool, right? And we'll learn it step by step. Don't worry, I'm there with you. Come on. Okay. Now the other, you know, uh, functional uh, classification of requirements, non-functional requirements, as we discussed, these are performance requirement. Uh, these includes the reliability parameter, security parameter, performance parameter, safety parameters, levels of service, supportability, retention, purge, the regional, uh, you know, approach and all those things. So there are many things which normally they are not included as a functionality to the product, but these uh, requirements are very important in terms of completing the solution. So unless and until you know the non-functional requirement, you couldn't satisfy the completeness of a product solution or services. So for that, non-functional requirements supplement the functional requirement and describe the environmental condition or qualities required for the product to be effective, right? So these are the non-functional requirements. Uh, like we said, in terms of uh, inter, um, you know, enhancing attendance, attendance management solution, the performance requirement was to get attendance notified in a 30 second time span for a given employee. Okay, you can excel that saying 10 seconds, but you can't, you know, exceed the time limits, um, you know, uh, mentioned in the uh, product because these are kind of finite requirements. Performance requirement or non-functional requirements are finite requirements. So there's normally yes or no as an answer. Could we satisfy? Yes. Couldn't we satisfy? Then we have a problem. We need to make sure we satisfy the non-functional requirement, which we have collected in terms of, you know, for a given product solution or scope. And then we'll make sure the product have completed uh, 10 requirements, 10 functional, non-functional requirement. And so we call the product as a final product, and then we can hand it over to the um, client and they can start using it and so on. So the transition and readiness of a requirement. These are specifically whenever you deploy a product to a client in an IT scenario, normally, let's say enhanced attendance management solution. What I'll do whenever the product is complete, I'll share it with at least, you know, 15, 20 different executives from a state farm saying, hey boss, uh, could you please check on this solution? Like what type of facilities do you think we need some tuning? Uh, if the screen color should be green, yellow, red, whatever, you know, what not. So mostly these are cosmetic, you know, uh, arrangement as well as training needs definition. So what we do, we normally try to understand how the client is going to use the product which we are created, developed for him. So in case of attendance management solution, I'll deploy a couple of ID scanner or biometric scanner in the office near to me and let them do their attendance day in, day out. This will give me a clear idea how the software is performing on the shop floor in the market and how useful it is for a client. I might improve it to a level where it's more suitable, it's more efficient for them, right? So these uh, transition and readiness requirement normally describe temporary capabilities such as data conversion in case I need to have, you know, even SAP integration because we have all historical employment leave records there and so on and so forth training requirements, like do I need to train somebody in terms of how do you put the finger, which finger to be put, which eye to be put, and if you normally mark the attendance with single eye, uh, so that eye is normally uh, record your attendance, so on and so forth. If you put other eye, the system might not recognize you as a Ravindra and something like that. So, so we need to train them to use the solutions, right? Needs to be transitioned from a current stage to the desired future state. So there could be some um, you know time where you have the manual as well as automated process uh, running in parallel. And this thing do happen. This is because the transition for a given entity might be, you know, slower, might be more of uh, uh, building their, uh, you know, understanding for the new system and so on and so forth. So we do have uh, certain, you know, transitioning uh, policies and procedure, training policies and procedure for our client to make sure they understand and utilize the product to the maximum efficiencies. Then, project requirement. These are basically actions, processes, or other condition of projects need to be big. Example include milestone date, contractual obligations, constraint. Now these basically talk about all the extra requirement or all the extra service level agreement we make with some client. 
stay from can uh, you know make a contract with infosys like their transitional or development partner saying ki boss if you develop this solution before christmas we might give you a 20000 dollar bonus these are kind of what you can say uh, strategies or tactics to make sure whatever solution we are developing whatever project we are implementing they come to us more and more quicker more and more efficient way and that's how we normally uh, puts uh, you know some uh, extra uh, incentives for that and this is how these type of uh, you know sls have been built again to the other side you might have certain uh, amounts uh, deducted from your payment if the products get delayed by so uh, after so and so date by so and so date and so on you know there could be some penalized uh, agreement or contract as well this thing do happen in a real life right and so there are repercussions of delays there are penal uh, you know charges or fines normally applied if you delay the project um, processes and everything you normally have these things in a governmental product a uh, governmental project like if government is building a bridge they have a finite schedule they have a finite scope to start with but it's normally delayed because of the you know uh, financial approvals delayed and or the raw materials are not avail available or something like that sort now even there we consider these things but there are certain circumstances which are uh, above and beyond our uh, you know uh, our human capability right so in that scenario the other party might consider of relaxing the sla as well depending upon the con uh, contractual obligations or con contractual statements we made these uh, analysis are also deployed or implemented in that, those scenarios then there are quality requirement these are again non performance requirement um, uh, sorry these are again non functional requirement so most performance requirement this captures any condition or criteria need to be validated for the successful completion of a project deliverable on fulfillment of a project requirement now let's say if state farm says i need to integrate at least uh, you know three or four offices uh, to have a complete understanding of your product so as a development partner we normally choose three or four product or these uh, three or uh, four offices locations are normally suggested by the client and we implement these solutions there if it's really uh, something like um, you know um, implementation uh, way of solution like you know you know to uh, implement some uh, hardware infrastructure uh, in those locations like uh, in our scenario we are talking about the biometrics right or um, Uh, the retina scanner, whatever means thumbprint scanner or retina scanner, whatever we are implementing, we need to start implementing for actual user acceptance testing on these locations at on these four or five locations, and that's how uh, these are the quality requirements or performance requirements included in our uh, system requirements section documents. All these has to be notified uh, or all these have to be marked so and categorized so and approved and validated so by the analysis. these are rules and responsibility of a typical analyst to have all these requirement categorized depending on the templates we use like the srs whatever your organizations they are going to work for they have the policy and procedures to categorize in it, these requirement in so many you know category so as a business analyst we do categorize this requirement it's not a rocket science it's simpler whenever you do a hands on ex experience on you know um, uh, srs we will understand in depth okay so what we do we normally collect requirements we also collect stakeholder wish list needs and all those things we build some conceptual solution requirement we can transition this requirement to a functionality we uh, you know build a deliverable call rtm and system requirement specification and we hand it to the development team this is as simple as the ba life cycle goes so our most important or elements uh, or you know outputs which are required by ba are system requirement specifications and the rtm the requirement traceability traceability matrix these are the two two things which are more crucial the others as we discussed among the you know six knowledge area those are also required but in um, organizations um, they could label it in a different way our srs normally includes all those flora and fauna whatever we build in terms of high level diagrams in terms of auditory proof in terms of the option we chose the decision analysis and all those things included in our sis we have a separate chapters to include all those things in our system requirement specification right 
and we also had a look at analytical thinking and problem solving as a skill set of VA. So what we are expected to do, we are expected to do a creative thinking to conceptualize the solution, decision making, to opt for the best possible alternatives available in the market, to keep learning because we work with different domains, right? And um, no human can achieve the uh, completeness of knowledge. Like that's a philosophy says. So we have to keep learning. We need to keep understanding the domain. We need to keep understanding the business problems. Try to understand the background as well. Try to build the solution which are more accurate and efficient to a given problem. We have to do a system thinking. How system will work? How I can adopt a solution uh, with a given system and technology available with me uh, at a given point, right? So um, do I adopt uh, the solution with the uh, uh, smartphone as well, should I, shouldn't I, and all those scenarios. And conceptual thinking. We build conceptual model for a development team so that they can understand the scope and length and breadth of the uh, solutions we have devised, we have conceived for them. We have to think visually. We need to think about the alternatives. We need to think about the business process improvements also. And these BPMs, as they normally refer, they are normally a workflows which we are thought through and then depicted in a diagram. It can be as simple as activity diagram or a use case diagram or mentioned in the uh, you know high level diagram. But yes, we need to depict these uh, workflows uh, visually in a diagram and hand it over to the development team. That's our one of the most important um, outputs. Yes, as I told you, this is the way PMI thinks, the project management thinks for an analyst. So we collect the project charter project management plan, project documents, business document agreements, enterprise environmental factor and organizational process assets. We discussed this in our last sessions, right? And then we create output like requirement documentation. This is what we call about uh, SRS system requirement specifications. They can be labeled differently in different organizations, but SRS is standardized way across North America, right? and requirement traceability matrix. This is called RTM, normally referred as a RTM. And RTM is one of the most important things the normally interviewer asks in an interview. So we need to understand RTM. Uh, do you know what is RTM? We've discussed in the last couple of sessions, right? We had a look at a video also. So could you recall what is RTM? Anybody want to tell me what is RTM? Anybody? Could you hear me? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, can anybody explain me what is R RTM, uh, Requirement Traceability Matrix? That's really bad, basically. See, these are the important interview questions which I discussed uh, last time. RTM is a kind of uh, as simple as a table or a word document where we create a traceability for a requirement. So how do you build traceability for a requirement? We normally trace it back to a minute submitting on an audio file where we have captured the requirement for the first time. You normally uh, mention the time, date, the stakeholder which have uh, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, describe the requirement, we normally include it in a min minutes of meeting, then we normally uh, uh, include it as a validated requirement uh, in our requirement list, then we talked about the, you know, yeah. approval given by somebody with timestamp, the stakeholder name and positions, so that that requirement is being validated and approved, and then we'll include it to a functionality list, so that uh, requirement has been converted to one functionality or many functionality or many requirements can be converted to one functionality. So these functionality lists are normally implemented in a product solution or services, whatever we are creating and we trace back all such functionality to a requirement. These traceability make sure we haven't missed a single requirement and all these requirements are implemented in a product to make sure the customer is satisfied. So RTM directly relates to the customer satisfaction and RTM normally solves all the doubts in the customer mind in terms of the way they've said the requirement and the way we understood the requirement 
the way it's implemented as a functionality in a product. So this traceability is very crucial for a business analyst, right? The SRS completeness is depends on RTM. That's a really big crucial statement. So whenever somebody asks you, why do you normally build RTM? To make sure the SRS, the system requirement selection, have all the floras and conas or the scope statement necessitated for the list of uh, requirements mentioned in the RTM. So we need to really, really keep practicing, right? try to write down these things somewhere because these are normally frequently asked questions in an interview. If you miss this, it's, it's really difficult to clear an interview as far as business analyst goes. Even RTM is a crucial part for a given project manager or a product owner where we normally collect all the requirements at a single place. And that's the requirement traceability matrix or a table. Uh, somebody might call them RTT also, requirement traceability table. It's actually a table. You can include it in a Microsoft Word or Excel or you know, uh, LibreOffice, Open System Office and all those things. At the end of the day, the list of requirements with the traceability from the initial inception to adoptivity and deployment in a given product, project or solution, that's the complete traceability we are talking about. And please, please don't forget this. Write down somewhere, listen to this session again, and try to make your own notes to explain these things. Can anybody, you know, explain me what is requirement traceability matrix now? Um, can we just write like it is used to record all the requirements given by the right. clients? Mm -hmm. So the purpose of RTM is to ensure that all the requirements that are mentioned by the clients are met. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Or it should be in a technical language. I mean, um, in a normal language, I can just put this much. No, that's really good. Means you, I can clearly understand. We need to. Uh, express ourselves as all, you know, also. And this is what analysts do. We are artists. We paint the vision and we convert it to a technicality. Believe me. And this is what the most crucial part of a personality whenever you be a BA. Mm -hmm. So business analysts are artists. They are scientists because we understand the vision, right? Understand. We are normally jotting down the thought process of a client or an important stakeholder to be precise. Could you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Okay, so this is what makes it very crucial. You can't have robot do that. Robot couldn't understand a vision. If you, you ever work with robotics or embedded or you know any of such technologies, you say. they can record your voice for you. They can understand your ups and downs of the overall, you know, the way you're speaking. They can understand the criticality importance and they can mark it to a label and all, that's okay. But still converting that vision to a requirement, to a functionality, that's a human job. Still, there's, there are no robots who, uh, you know, who can address these uh, requirements. So BAs are artists. They paint the vision to a level where the product definition are conceptualized. And RTMs helps you in that greatly. The SRS is a supporting document, as you can say. But SRS is a crucial artifact which gets created out of RTM or with the RTM to make sure we have all the environmental factors required to make that definition complete. So when somebody, you know, give you a wish list, Meravala Green, right? You you can understand that, uh, you know, ad. You can remember that ad. When that lady, you know, uh, takes up capsicum and goes to a store saying, I want uh, this, this type of wool. And, you know, that ad was really famous in India. It's called Meravala Green. And they really capture the actual vision. How you actually implement the vision into the thought process or the exact requirement. She literally carried that capsicum from he, uh, her house to a wool store saying, okay, I need these uh, green wools like these, something like that. Because um, as we know, every color, uh, they have their own shining, they have their own uh, way of depicting in different light. So that's how we normally collect the conciseness of requirement. So you need to have these two documents as an output of a BA. And this is really crucial. I would really humbly request you to please jot down such scenario in your own word so that you can explain to the interviewer in confidence. Okay, Chalo, let's move on to the next topic. Um, come on. Okay. Uh, so we can oh, right. express ourselves in the normal language too. It shouldn't be the technical ones, right? Uh, Ma'am, uh, technical language is a necessary because, you know, 
that's what we do right as an analyst yeah mm-hmm. as a project manager you are very right first you need to understand it as a human for an artist to paint a picture he should know the theme right yeah so mm-hmm. unless and until you know the theme you can't express it. so you will explain the theme first in your own language and technicality will be there but unless and until you can express yourself it's difficult interview is all about expressing yourself right expressing your personality or selling your personality the way devji clearly says so unless and until you can market your personality uh, there's no way to clear the interview could you understand what i'm trying to say yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. and um, everybody please speak up if you keep silent or you know uh, keep on a, um, what you can say back burner uh, you'll not be uh, what i can say um, see as a human we are interactive in our nature so unless and until you speak up try to explain in your way there's no right or wrong here we are trying to understand management of the complete solution product vision right so the way you should explain is your way so there's no right or wrong i can't say you know um, um, pritiji is not right or something like that because these are all management techniques tools and techniques we do work as an artist as a human and these process can't be automated that's a fact as simple as that why because these are critical crucial process we are trying to understand the intricacy of a human mind because vision resides there right we understand the intricacy of the vision convert it to a document plus pictures so srs is normally combination of list of requirement as we said in rtm plus some high level dog- diagrams some uml diagrams why we need diagrams because one diagram can explain 1000 words and we'll see how and how not because all these diagrams suffice the completeness of the requirement believe me you'll experience that by yourself whenever you build use case diagram whenever you build a high level diagram okay so we'll reach there now let's start to understand how do we collect these requirements what are the standard processes and policies adopted industry wide there is something called brainstorming here we are doing brainstorming right and trying to make sure you should understand how that vision is converted to a requirement to convert it to a functionality this is what we do brainstorming but unless and until you speak it's a one way process means i'm just talking 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 i don't know how much you are in sync how much you can conceive how much you can include in your thought process that's the need because the end game is basically you speak uh, you know you speak your own um, words of analysis you can could be able to explain the process of analysis in your words rather than the words i speak right so this is this should be starting now you should starting speaking up more and more and the more we are interactive the more you can be uh, interactive throughout the interview as well so this is going to help the more and more you speak more and more you express your uh, you know idea in your words i know you couldn't uh, you know use technical words from day one that's the result what we want that will come in a few days few weeks but you have to start somewhere start with whatever you know in terms of your domain there could be some banking expert there could be some you know support experts which can express uh, overall uh, analysis process in their uh, words and this is a kind of need of the hour so start expressing right it should be a brainstorming so brainstorming you work together you normally try to express yourself try to express your understanding of a vision requirement so that we can make the requirement concise you normally jot down text as well as images right document analysis now sometimes as we spoke about our you know standard uh, example uh, enhancing attendance management so you know process for a state law here if clients gives you some photo of how they you know recording the attendance manual right um, you know person comes he normally signs the register uh, against his name he show his photo id to a supervisor and then he walks into the office that's a normal uh, older way of doing attendance okay now this the document um, the client might give you that register client might give you a couple of photos uh, the you know attendee showing his photo id to the supervisor and supervisor agreeing to it. Um, you know, the client also can give you some movies and all right so all these client supplied material all these document have to be understood or included in our requirement um, analysis process or a gap analysis process where we build the scope of this migration project mostly 
so all the migration process you normally get the documents or supplied client documents that's how we normally label in a typical technical terminology so we analyze this document whatever supplied by client to us for building better product scope solution services then we also build something called focus group these are subject matter experts so what, why we use subject matter experts because as a ravindra i never work with biometric i never work with uh, retina scanner so what i do in the infosys we have a cell called subject matter expert or center of excellence coe sme coe and sme so these uh, you know uh, matured persons or domain experts how they are normally referred in a layman's term Uh, they are available for a given project for a couple of hours, couple of days, couple of months, depending on the requirement of a project. So what I'll do, I'll um, you know call or email PMO, PH PMO, could you please give me SME or COE for biometric scanner or retina scanner? So PMO will reply to me saying, oh yes, sir, Vinay, you are you know BA in this uh, new attendance management uh, solution for state form. So let me give you you know um, Satya Prakash. who is available as an coe for uh, retina scanner and biometric he implemented around 10 15 projects uh, on that so he know all the you know uh, flora fauna cos this that and other uh, so that he can work with you closely so i'll mark his uh, day his hours and you know depending upon the requirement i normally discuss it with him so how do you think how we can integrate a retina scanner biometric scanner for a given you know area for a given type of uh, you know people and all those things so he might uh, you know suggest me so if you have a office in canada vancouver in cold days you normally do, uh, couldn't use the biometric scanner because it gets foggy uh, you can't use uh, you know retina scanner if your eyes are too light blue you need to have sony scanner for that the philips scanner can't um, scan it uh, up to a great depth of color and all those things so all such kind of pitfalls and shortcomings are normally explained to me uh, to me by these subject matter experts center of excellence there could be some subject matter experts on hr policies and processes so he or she will guide me which all type of data elements i need to collect from sap as an historical data available for the employees of a set form so something like that sort so i required these coes and sme to make sure whatever solution we are suggesting as an organizations uh, infosys is most suitable for the of um, you know other organizations called state farm something like that sir so we take help of such guys it's not really required for me to know each and everything in the world that's not possible so sometime i leverage from certain personalities certain resources available with my organizations these are called subject matter experts and center of excellence then we have interface analysis these are specifically called user engineering so we decide if you are residing in let's say north america which colors uh, are suitable for your eyes like we normally use uh, white light blue backgrounds a uh, dark blue you know uh, headers or you know menu items and all those things these are standardized as per the region if you work in gcc uh, region like dubai bahrain and you know um, all those countries they normally prefer a greener uh, shades of uh, these things if you go to you know uh, south asian countries they normally prefer um the saturn uh, the orange and those colors combinations these things are basically regional who will guide me on these these are basically usability engineering guys so these are user centric design approaches we need to adopt these things for a given region for a given culture frankly speaking and that's how we do with the help of interface analysts or usability engineers these are also leveraged like focus group smes and coes now we do interview of a stakeholders let's say if uh, ravinder from state farm have expressed a wish list of saying ki when i visit uh, from north america to canada i should have my you know uh, attendance uh, carried forward uh, uh, even if i change the time zone and all a normal wish right a normal wish from a important stakeholder so i'll include this wish are uh, in the requirement saying you okay we need to uniform the time um, you know um, uh, travel across time for a certain resources so these resources whenever they get uh, their you know retina scanned in canadian office the day start from there till whatever hours these guys have calculated for the leaves the gaps and all those things and i calculate depending upon how many hours he or she worked at the uh, 
uh, other office wherever he have deployed for certain days, certain time, or shifted permanently. So those kind of resource movement should be included in my uh, requirement or list of requirement uh, as an uh, given by a detailed stakeholder. If I need any details, I might call Ravindra saying, "Hey, Ravindra, you have expressed a wish at that time on so on so date. Whenever we are meeting, whenever we are discussing in a meeting." Now, I want to understand certain special conditions regarding that. So, Ravindra will be happy to give you a time because that's more important to him. He keeps shifting between time zones. He keeps shifting between offices. So, for such scenario, I plan something called interview. You call him. You, you know, plan a Zoom meet. You plan a Google meet for such, uh, you know, requirement gathering techniques. So, you collect extra, uh, you know, exceptions, scenarios on such requirements from such typical singular stakeholder okay interview is basically one on one brainstorming is one too many and everybody is speaking in a definite uh, disciplined way then there are observations as an analyst i might go to a state form office and trying to understand their older way of attending the requirement how they do attend the uh, you know how they basically uh, sorry marking the uh, attendance basically like the manual way i might observe that and then basically uh, repeat the process in a you know activity diagram saying this is how they were doing previously now this is how they are going to do it in the future so instead of signing a register they'll just put a, their thumb or an eye against a scanner and that's it they'll walk into the office and then well uh, they'll put a thumb and eye against the scanner and then the door will open and then the, the employee can walk in or the approved guest can walk in if he or she haven't put the right finger or right eye against that scanner the door won't open. And this is the normal applications nowadays. Whenever if you go to an office, you have to put uh, you know, your bi biometrics so that your attendance is marked. It's not just the you know entrance, even your card, whatever be given to you as a guest and all, normally have your picture and your name uh, clearly mentioned so that everybody can refer to you in our know, bigger offices. And if you put that uh, card against a scanner, the uh, card scanner understand who, you, who are you, what type of you know age group uh, you know uh, positions uh, credibility you have within their offices so that all your you know uh, access to the offices uh, are marked are normally noted by the system and this is what we have to observe these are not included in a requirement but as an analyst we have to uh, if we can and this is how the overall scenario of the you know uh, analyst get depicted you include all these such minor micro points within your requirements to make sure the requirement is concise in itself. And it's an evolutionary factor rather than any scientific approach. This is again a part of the artistic nature of a personality. So the more you, you know, detail your requirement, the more it can help the development to implement in depth. And the more facilities or, you know, uh, cost uh, or incomes can be incurred to the development partner. And this is how you normally improve the scope of the given um, uh, product projects or scope, right? Let's look at a couple of others as well. Requirement gathering techniques. Uh, there are something like survey of questionnaire. As now we live in something like a remote working area. So what we do, we normally create a web page. Well, we, in the sense, not the analyst as in you. You normally give your request to a development team and they'll create some survey of questionnaire. These are kind of web page where you ask questions and the other party we normally give you answer. So if you ask Ravindra who keeps traveling between North America and Canada saying he, he was what I was really worried about is the timestamp or overlap. Like if you're traveling in between the day, how should I mark your attendance? So all such query, I can put it via email. I can put it uh, in a kind of, you know, uh, reactive web page or, uh, you know, where he can basically uh, suggest all the you know, conditions and scenario and come back to me. So rather than I'm disturbing him on a call because we are traveling on those things, he can fill such form on an airport or on um, while on the plane or, you know, wherever he or she wants uh, gets a time. So survey and questionnaire is kind of disconnected way to uh, understand uh, requirement in depth. You could do it with, uh, you know, a web page, uh, an SMS, a WhatsApp and something like that sort also. You can deploy questionnaires or survey via WhatsApp. I'll build a list of questions and put it on a WhatsApp, right? I can do that. 
because normally i have whatsapp connected to my laptop desktop and all those things also so these are basically kind of disconnected way of collecting the requirements in a depth and using it as an auditory tool then there's something called prototyping if you are building a rocket if you are building a new weapon right these are very costly project product so how do you build it you build it step by step first you try to build a prototype you build a small version of it with fewer functionality so if you are building a you know a satellite launcher i could build a small rocket which can fly up to let's say 50 meter at the most and then i can build actual ro rocket which can fly up to moon or you know what not those kind of scenario so prototyping or proof of concept we normally refer as a poc so if somebody ask you have you done any poc it means proof of concept these are the prototypings they are normally done for each and every robot we create each and every you know even driverless car whatever we create we have build a prototype first so that we can start addressing functionalities one by one and build something right so let's have a look at a video where we'll try to understand how we build this uh, you know uh, 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 requirement gathering as an analyst so let me play that video for you and then we'll discuss in depth let me stop this you know uh, presentation i'll go here give me a minute till it's coming up and i'll share this video with you he this guy have explained it really good means uh, uh, if you want to understand how the analysis functions this guy does a really great job uh, let's try to hear him hello and welcome to my channel i am the pa tutor not the channel i talk about everything uh, i'll also share a youtube link for this so you can you know subscribe to his channel if you want to he's a good tutor and he's a young personality who expresses business analyst he's a really great tutor believe me have a look at this guy in regards to being a business analyst so if you're interested please make sure you guys go ahead and subscribe and help me a lot when you support the channel with that being said today's topic is going to be how to do requirements gathering so what is requirements gathering how do you go about it what are all the steps involved i'll be walking you guys through that process right now so obviously the question is how to do requirements gathering first of all what is requirements gathering right that's the first question the first step of this entire process well uh, i've got videos where i go into uh, depth about this about requirements gathering being the main thing that a, a business analyst does you guys can go check out those videos i also have a course a beginner business analyst course that i walk through in detail about this process so if you're interested in that link is in the description for the course but with that being said uh requirements gathering is the essential component of what a business analyst does okay so essentially requirements gathering and uh you know requirements documentation that is how a business analyst um, achieves and tries to solve the problem so again um whatever the problem is going to be for a business analyst uh they are going to go ahead and try to elicit the requirements to understand that problem from stakeholders okay so again i've always drawn this upside down triangle uh for you guys to remember so if i've got business which i'll put short here for plus the business stakeholders and i've got it developers you've got the ba that's going to be in the middle and they are going to go ahead and elicit and gather the requirements from the stakeholders okay so they're going to go ahead and, and get those requirements from the stakeholders that is going to be the requirements gathering and then after they gather those requirements they're going to go ahead and then uh, translate it into a way that the IT developers are going to be able to code okay because these two entities cannot speak to each other that is where the business analyst comes into play and they gather the requirements and then they elicit or, or gather and elicit and then they translate the requirements okay so that is essentially going to be the first step in terms of understanding what exactly i mean by requirements gathering okay what are requirements gathering and what exactly how exactly do you do it okay so that's really the first step here uh, and once you understand this 
now we can go ahead and, and move into the next step, which is understanding really the project for yourself. Okay, so as a business analyst, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to be assigned a project. Okay, once you're assigned a project, uh, the first thing to do is understand what the project is about. Okay, for as a business analyst, a problem problem. Okay, the project is obviously going to have a problem. They are going to have something there that they are either trying to fix, um, they are trying to um, achieve, that they are trying to enhance, that they are trying to, you know, you know, find a way to make it work. So uh, whatever that problem is, you need to understand what that problem is. Okay. And I use the IT world as my main example here, because it's, you know, that's, that's the field that I'm in as a PA. Um, so if it is a software change with a screen and, you know, the, the project is talking about changing a screen, changing the components of a screen. That's the problem. Okay. The problem is that they have a screen that is not as enhanced and optimized as they would like to, and they want to add these components and whatever those com components are, those kind of details, those are going to be the requirements that you're going to be gathering. Now I will get into that in a second here, but just understand you cannot move forward with this until you understand what exactly the project is going to be about. Okay. So you can't just go and, and expect to gather the requirements that you don't know. Okay. You need to understand what the problem is. Okay. Now, hopefully we are all on the same page here and we understand the first step, which is understand the project and what hopefully you have to What is the problem being solved? Okay. So again, whatever it is, it could be anything. You could be updating a document. You could be updating a screen. You could be you know, a changing a back end or front end, it doesn't matter, but you have to figure out what it is, whatever that problem is that you are solving, understand it. Once you have understood it and now you know, okay, I know what the problem is. I know what we're trying to solve. I know what we're trying to do. Now it's time to go ahead and set up meeting. with okay. this is the next step set up your meetings with the business stakeholders so once i've understood the problem i'm ready now to go ahead and move on to gather these requirements so again the example i always use which is easy to understand is a screen being updated okay if you've got a, a screen a, a software that uh you know the company wants to optimize the business i should say uh, the business stakeholders want to optimize. They've got a bunch of different things they want to do to this page. And they expect you as the business analyst to be able to understand all of the changes so that the developers can go ahead and then code those changes and update the screen. So since you have understood that that is the problem to update the screen, now you set up the meeting with the stakeholders, okay, to do what? To what I like to call Okay, now again, requirements gathering, requirements elicitation, same thing. You're discovering the requirements, okay? All right. I'm talking to my stakeholders now. I'm understanding. Okay, we are trying to change the screen, okay? And I know the reason why we're trying to do it. It's not as optimized. And now the question becomes, how or what are these specific changes, okay? So as DPA, you need to ask the right questions. You need to make sure that no stone is unturned. Ask everything about the requirements, okay? All of, so I'll use the example of the screen. What are all the components being changed, being impacted, okay? And what are the, you know, impacts for these other changes uh, that we're not touching? So. Um, if it's a toggle, if it's a button, um, is it, you know, something that we're uh, doing to optimize, you know, a certain area, like you have to make sure that you are covering every single thing that the business says, you know, basically it's simple. 
we're going to add three buttons on the page and we're going to go ahead and maybe, uh, you know, remove uh, this portion of it. And we want the screen to be a little, uh, you know, shorter, the text, the change, the, the color should be this and that. So make sure you obviously ask all the right questions and all the right questions are going to be making sure that all of the requirements are being captured. Now, again, this is also going to depend on the methodology that you take. So you can have an agile versus a waterfall. Waterfall methodology. Now, again, uh, these are two different methodologies. If you're not aware, check out my other videos. I'll talk about this in my course again. Um, and depending on this, um, this is really going to help you out because uh, what you're trying to do here, not just obviously understand all the requirements that you have to every single one, you're trying to lock down the scope. Okay? Because here's the thing in an agile format, uh, the scope, uh, making sure that it's locked down. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, as strict and stringent because you've got multiple sprints where you can maybe make multiple changes. But in a waterfall methodology, once they've said, we're adding three buttons, and then they come back to business and says, no, we actually want four, it's going to be tough to change it. So you, that's why I'm saying you want to make sure you ask all the right questions so that the business knows that these are the requirements that you have laid out to me, and I'm going ahead and I'm capturing those also want to make sure that you are asking the why. Now, again, to understand the project, you also want to know, okay, you said we're adding two buttons here, but can we do one and, you know, make it, make it more efficient? Do we need three here? Like, those are the questions you need to ask because if they just tell you, um, it's it's not just going to be enough for you as the BA to just take it and, and, and you know, write it down. You have to ask the why. You have to understand, really, okay, the reasoning for why we need two versus three. Can we reduce it? Can we, you know, go to one? So ask all those questions. Make sure all of that is covered. And obviously methodology is going to play a part in here. But finally, step number three is going to be the obvious step is you're going to begin writing the requirements. So different ways to capture it. Again, depends on methodology. If you go by agile methodology, you're going to do user stories. If you go by waterfall methodology, we'll do something called a PRD, a business requirements document. Uh, these are different uh, ways to capture the requirements, uh, but for the most part, it depends on methodology. But yeah, you can go ahead and you can start writing your requirements. Once you have done the discovery, now when I say set up meetings, these are S meetings, plural, multiple ones, okay? Uh, more than likely, you're not going to get all the requirements in one meeting, or you'll have questions that come up, or you'll have concerns, comments, et cetera. And so you're probably going to need more uh, than one or two meetings. And so once you've done all that, then you can go ahead and begin your writing requirements. But again, you don't have to wait to write the requirements until all of this is done. You can start this process and still do this and keep adding to it. Just make sure you understand that by the time uh, you get all of the requirements, the scope doesn't change depending on the methodology that you are, that your project is in, okay? So essentially that is how you do it, how you uh, do requirements gathering. You go ahead and you understand the project, you understand what is the problem being solved, you set up discovery meetings with the business stakeholders, and then you go ahead and obviously determine the methodology of the project, and then you begin writing the requirements. So hopefully that helps you guys out if it does, please make sure you give this video. So you get an idea, like how the overall requirements are gathered. If I missed anything, um, this person have explained it really well. So that's why I normally play this video. Now let's try to understand the BRD and SRS part of it. Well, wherever you join, the organization will have their templates. The organization will have their policies and procedures shared with you. Whenever an employee join, we have something called induction workshop. In North America, it's called induction, employee induction, basically. And it's workshop because they let you plan, they let you understand how the policies and procedure are implemented in a given company. Okay, I used to work for Enterprise in the car in, uh, you know, Crawford Group, one of the most uh, richest group um, across North American region, where we used to have almost a week full of employee induction workshops. So for a week, 
we used to go to training, um, you know, rooms. There were trainers, there were department, uh, various departmental heads. They used to come and present themselves, their department workings, the organizational inception, organizational history and everything. So that you'll understand the organizations, the way organization functions and everything. So all these templates are given to you whenever you join an organization. There are some uh, certain words used in a mixed sense, something like business requirement document. These are shared by the client like State Farm. We as a technology partner, we create functional requirement document or FRS or SRS. FRS are normally created or ownership of a designer or architect. SRS ownership, system requirement specification ownership is with the um, BA, business um, analyst. So as a BA, we create these, uh, you know, SRS and give it to the development team so that they can create FRS. Okay. Now let's start to understand actual tools, right? How do we collect requirement? Okay, uh, one question. Do you want me to stop now or should I, should we start with tools uh, in the requirement gathering process? I need your thing. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I can take more half an hour if it's okay with you. It's almost, uh, you know, 10.30 in your clock. So please do suggest me. I'm fine with either way. We can continue. Okay, sure. No problem. That, that's okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, let's try to understand how do we collect requirement. The simplest way is to create a flow chart. Now, what is a flow chart? Uh, many of you have done bachelor's in engineering, right? They might have had flow chart as understanding or, uh, you know, uh, understanding the way the things are working, right? And that's how we use flow chart in good old days. It's still uh, many undisciplined way of collecting requirements as in flow chart. So here um, they've depicted a flow chart of a patient coming to a uh, hospital. Let's try to understand one. There's a start. The patient arrives at a hospital to reception desk, right? Uh, the reception is checked out if the patient is registered or not. If he yes, then the reception will allocate him a nurse, you know, and um, that nurse will take him to a specific doctor, department or whatnot. If it's not, then you'll get it registered. And then basically, then it'll go, it means uh, for registered, the patient might have to need to fill the forms, uh, submit some insurance document, give a photo ID and blah, blah, blah things. After that pro procedure has been completed, the similar process applies to him as a registered per uh, person, right? And then he'll, uh, if the nurse are not available, he, he or she might need to wait till the nurse gets available. Then go to a specific department doctor, record your health condition, tell them what's a problem, what's the issue. If you're a you know, repetitive uh, um, I'll not say client, patient, then doctor know your history. So he might ask a question to start with. Are you getting the, you know, cough like you had before, like three months before? Are you have, you know, your knee problem like you had, um, you know, few years early and so on and so forth. So these available doctors normally try to understand from you what you have, your problem, and then they prescribe the medicine. It's as simple as a uh, simple process they've depicted in a flow chart, right? Now, this is important for a business analyst to understand how, let's say we are discussing about the attendance uh, procedure, right? So we need to understand or we need to depict this attendance procedure in a flow chart. How do I depict as a start? Employee arrive, arrives from a gate to a door, right? Gate is the main gate. Door is basically door of your building, door of your office. Now there you have a biometric and um, there you used to do like you used to sign on a register called attendance register where uh, your name you sign for a day, right? Normally you have a name and a number of days and you need to sign in that day. And then you present your ID to the supervisor or a person who is basically making sure whatever you are signing is in line, um, is the same person you are. And that way you complete your attendance process and then you can go into the office and start working. Something like that sort. So I can depict this thing in a flow chart. Start, the you know employee arrives. Is he a regular employee or he is deputed from other office or is he a guest? If he's a guest, then, uh, you know, uh, allocate him uh, in the system, uh, give him a guest uh, visitor pass or whatnot. And then basically he'll go to the door. He'll sign the register. He'll mention his name if he's a guest or additional person. If he's a normal employee, he has his name, uh, his or her name, signed against his uh, name or uh, name and basically show his ID, picture ID to the supervisor and then walk into the office and start doing things, whatever he or she needs to be done. Something like that. 
So for these type of process, I build a flow chart and the optional path, uh, you know, optional path there to this process. And this is simple, a kind of typical activity chart. Okay. In UML, this flow chart is called activity diagram. Now, why we use UML? UML is Unified Modeling Language. In late 90s, uh, engineers came together and started building a uniform architectural language. And that's what we call uni uh, Unified Modeling Language. Now it's labeled as Unified Modeling Language. Now the UML have been evolved many years, right? From 90s, we are now almost, you know, uh, 2021, 2022, we are basically got a standardized tool set for each and every action you can depict, for each and every alternate path you can depict. So then we learn activity uh, diagrams rather than flow chart. Okay, uh, oh, come on. Now this activity diagram is a unified way. This is a well-known depictions, well-known pictorial uh, representation we use to describe the activity flow of a system. Describe the sequence of a uh, activity from one to another, describe parallel or branch concurrent flow of the system. So uh, here I'll say for an employee, there's a one activity, a registered gate, a registered guest, already registered guest have one activity, then a new guest will have to get registered. So there's another activity. So I'm depicting all this parallel branch concurrent flow of the system in this ITP diagram. Okay, let's try to understand and you know, uh, uh, think about something like receive order from a customer. So a customer goes to a shop, right? And um, uh, tell a, a shop, uh, like I need something, something, something. So let's see, he needs certain, um, no, um, you know, certain books, notebooks. Let's say he needs certain notebooks from uh, a shop. So he go to a corner shop and there he normally uh, go to the shelf, get a couple of notebooks, uh, put it on the um, cash counter, pays the cash card, uh, pay DM, ATM, GTM, whatnot, and then take the books and walk out. Otherwise, he go to Amazon, he search for the notebook, size, shape, color, whatever he needed. He place the order, uh, he check for the delivery time, blah, blah, schedule and everything. He pay by online mechanism, anything card, you know, pay DM, GTM, he, this DM, that DM, and then get the book or uh, notebook shipped to him. It'll re uh, receive to him uh, within the uh, due course of time and then it'll start using. So these are kind of how to process the order for a given entity, right? So we can draw an activity diagram for this, some type of order processing. So we can depict all type of such activities step by step in a pictorial manner. Okay, now why activity diagram? It's a standardized way of depicting a business process. Okay, so this is why we call modeling business requirement. Modeling workflow for using various activity for a given actor. The person who is doing is an actor. He's acting something. He's actionating some items, right? So that's why. It's a high level understanding of system functionality. So for each and every critical uh, you know, system functionality, I keep building activity diagrams to explain it in a more depth to a given scenario. Investigating business requirement at a larger stage kind guide us on a scope, limitations, system boundaries, and so on and so forth. We'll see how we, you know, we can depict scope, limitations, and all these things in a diagram. We'll practice it a bit. And then standardized format of flow charting with a definite meaning of a symbol set. So this is a universal diagram which is used across the world. Now, whatever we discuss as an order management system, take a time to understand how that step-by-step -step process is explained here, right? A customer, uh, um, the process starts, there's a black dot with a solid sphere is mentioned there, which is a standard symbol. Then we have an arrow uh, depicting or, you know, entering into the customer's pains, uh, sends an order request. So he can send the order request uh, on Amazon or he can call somebody and uh, send the order request. And then order management, the order request system confirms the receipt of order. So if you're placing it on Amazon, it will give you a confirmation. Okay, you're placing the order for six notebook of a brown color of A4 size, right? And this says it confirms the order. Check the order, uh, if it's a normal order or not. Normal in the sense, is the product ready with the system? If it's not, like in, if you go to a restaurant, they might need to put some certain rice, curry, whatnot, whatever you want to order, right? So then there's a special order. That's what they call. 
So you need to do certain things. There are some human intervention in that. So in such scenario, it's a kind of special order. So there's this condition here they mentioned. See, this again depends on the, uh, the way you analyze the requirement. Uh, analyst can go in depth in number of alternatives available, or you can, you know, uh, create a you know thought process, build on your thought process and draw an activity diagram. Well, um, there could be differentiation in terms of number of paths you have chosen, but the symbol set will be uniform as far as activity diagrams are concerned, right? And something like that. Then we have check if the order is special, if it's ready, uh, place the order. If it's uh, not a special order, just dispatch the order, dispatch the items basically rather than dispatch the order. So you dispatch the item and then receive it to, uh, to the concerned person in few days. This is how the activity diagram are normally deployed. Now, what I want you to depict, create an activity diagram and try to uh, you know, showcase an employee registering his attendance. Please take it as a homework. You have to draw an attendance uh, activity diagram, which basically depicts an uh, attendance of an employee at state form or you know choose whatever office you want to choose as an example but yes this is what will make sure uh, uh, make sure you understand the thought process right uh, i might share a couple of uh, I, I will share a couple of activity diagrams video so that you can learn in depth how the activity diagrams are drawn so please don't worry on that part it's the simplest thing you can do and this is the simplest tool you can use while understanding any process you can use this activity diagram to understand which is the best alternative path for dropping my kid to the school. Yes, you can do that. You can, uh, you know, think about number of signals in the path. You can uh, think about number of uh, heavy traffic uh, junctions which I cross across the path, and then ignore these things and something like that. So, so you can effectively plan your activities with these activity di activity diagrams um, uh, one by one at a time, and then solve your critical problems of your day-to-day -day life, right? And I'll also share the, you know, uh, um, uh, PPT so that you can go through the six knowledge, um, you know, um, the six uh, knowledge area as far as business analyst goes and various link which I have mentioned there. So you can try to go through it and understand the business analysis process from the start. Then you'll understand in depth why we are using these tools, what makes these tools special and where this tool fits into the overall business analysis functionalities or business analysis solution approach we uh, are doing, right? In addition to that, as I told you, I'll share a tutorial on activity diagram so that you can draw the activity diagram of an employee marking his attendance in any office of your choice, right? Let's take a further and try to understand another most mature tool. I really like this tool because it's a really mature tool and this is used at NASA, US military and various other very matured organizations. Even uh, at Kangi Melan, we use these tools to basically make sure whatever requirement, however they are ex uh, you know, exceptional, they can be depicted in something called use case diagram. This is also one of the diagramming modeling techniques used in UML, Unified Modeling Language, right? Let's try to understand how use case diagrams are done. Use case describes a sequence of actions performed by an actor or by a system that provides value to an actor. Here, the actors are customers, time, payment processor, customer support, tax offer. Could you see that use case diagram um, slide on uh, on your uh, you know laptop? Yes. Okay, great. So let's try to understand one by one. So use case are basically these oval shape, you know, um, uh, figures we've drawn on uh, our, uh, you know, diagram, the actors are drawn as a human figure, right? And these are, can be drawn with pen and paper. There are various even free tools available. I'll share them with you so that you can draw an use case diagram, whatever you want to depict. The use case describes the system behavior under various conditions. So use case diagram basically explain you how the system should must or behaving as far as the scenario of the actor inter uh, uh, interaction with the system. The use case describes the system's behavior under various conditions as it responds to a request form. Well, actor does a request, right? It search for item, place an item, you know, place an order or something like that. So, right now, 
is response to a request from one of the stakeholder called primary actor. So every use case diagram is drawn with a primary actor in mind. So customer is one actor. Then we won't include time as an actor in the same diagram. So that time actor is a separate diagram. If you can see there, right? So there's a, these rectangular boxes release two. They depict that scope. Release one is another scope. So these rectangular boxes, whatever we draw, those are scope limitations. The actor is outside scope because actor is not manufactured at the system. Whatever you do within the system is considered inside the box. Whoever is interacting from outside the systems are considered as an actors or action figures or humans like us. There could be some separate system replying to you as well. Like in the case of release one, the payment processor is replying. It's a system. It's an entity inside uh, your computer or, uh, you know, a separate bank is replying to your, you know, payment uh, for the given order, something like that. So, right. And then uh, we basically process this thing. This is again, same thing. We are order food use case here, right? And let's try to understand how this use case diagram works. Let me play you a video where that lady really explains in depth what type of use case diagram we have to draw in terms of a typical business analysis roles, right? So let me try to share that, uh, you know, with you. Uh, give me a minute to start that thing. This is one Hi. of my uh, favorite video where she really explained in depth how an UML diagram should be drawn. What all things we have to include in that use case diagram to make sure it it's have a conciseness in it. And she also explained an open source tool free tool available to you called Lucid Use Case Diagram. Let's hear her out. Hi, and I'll be teaching you everything you need to know about UML Use Case Diagrams. We'll start with a high-level overview, then we'll talk about systems, actors, use cases, and relationships. And finally, we'll build an entire use case diagram together and go over examples to explain these concepts in depth. Have you ever had an idea that makes perfect sense in your head, but when you try to explain it to someone else, they're completely lost? Maybe your idea is for a new app, and every time you talk about it, people don't really understand how they interact with the app or what it would do. This type of scenario is where a use case diagram is very helpful. Here's a simple description of a use case diagram. First, it shows a system or application. Then it shows the people, organizations, or other systems that interact with it. And finally, it shows a basic flow of what the system or application does. It's a very high level diagram and typically won't show a lot of detail, but it's a great way to communicate complex ideas in a fairly basic way. Before we really get into the tutorial, let's talk about how you're going to make a use case diagram. You can draw them out with pen and paper, but a diagramming application is going to be much easier. Today I'll be using Lucidchart, and you can too, for free actually. Just click the link to access Lucidchart's website. Enter your email address and you'll have a free Lucidchart account in just a few seconds. It's easy to use and you can follow along with me as we build a use case diagram. Okay, so we're going to break down use case diagrams into four different elements. Systems, actors, use cases, and relationships. Let's start with systems. A system is whatever you're developing. It could be a website, a software component, a business process, an app, or any number of other things. You represent a system with a rectangle and you put the name of the system at the top. We're going to build a use case diagram for a very simple banking application. We'll call our system banking app. This rectangle helps define the scope of this system. Anything within this rectangle happens within the banking app. Anything outside of this rectangle doesn't happen in the banking app. The next element is an actor, which is depicted by this stick figure. An actor is going to be someone or something that uses our system to achieve a goal. That could be a person, an organization, another system, or an external device. So who or what is going to be using our banking app? The most obvious actor is a customer. We're going to have customers that download and use our banking app. Another actor that we'll want in our diagram is the bank. The bank is going to provide information that feeds into our banking app, like transactions and account balances. Here are a couple of things to keep in mind when dealing with actors. First, it's important to note that these actors are external objects. They always need to be placed outside of our system. Second, actors need to be thought of as types or categories. For our banking app, an actor isn't going to be a specific individual or a specific organization. We won't label our actors as John and Chase Bank. We want to keep things categorical. So right now we're saying that both customers 
and banks are going to use our app. And this brings up the topic of primary and secondary actors. A primary actor initiates the use of the system, while a secondary actor is more reactionary. So in our example, which actor is primary and which actor is secondary? The primary actor is customer. The customer is going to initiate the use of our system. They're going to pull out their phone, open up our banking app, and do something with it. Bank, on the other hand, is a secondary actor. The bank is only going to act once the customer does something. If the customer goes on the app to see how much money is in their account, only then does the bank engage with our system to provide the balance. Primary actors should be to the left of the system, and secondary actors should be to the right. This just visually reinforces the fact that customer engages with the banking app and then the bank reacts. The next element is a use case, and this is where you really start to describe what our system does. A use case is depicted with this oval shape, and it represents an action that accomplishes some sort of task within the system. They're going to be placed within the rectangle because they're actions that occur within the banking app. So what is our banking app going to do? We're going to keep things very simple. Our banking app is going to allow a customer to log in, check their account balance, transfer funds between accounts, and make payments towards bills. So if this is what our banking app does, we're going to have use cases that describe each of those actions. We'll have a use case called login, another called check balance, another called transfer funds, and finally make payment. You can see that each of these use cases starts with a verb and reinforces an action that takes place. We also want them to be sufficiently descriptive. If this use case just said transfer, that'd be too vague. Finally, it's good practice to put your use cases in a logical order when possible. That's why we put login at the top. That's the first thing that will happen when a customer uses our banking app. The final element in use case diagrams are relationships. An actor, by definition, is using our system to achieve a goal. So each actor has to interact with at least one of the use cases within our system. In our example, a customer is going to log into our banking app. So we draw a solid line between the actor and the use case to show this relationship. This type of relationship is called an association, and it just signifies a basic communication or interaction. A customer is going to interact with the rest of these use cases as well. They're going to check balance, transfer funds, and make payment. So we'll draw solid lines out to each of those as well. Secondary actors will also have relationships. Remember, each actor has to interact with at least one use case. So which use cases will the bank interact with? When a customer wants to check their balance on the app, the bank is going to provide the correct amount. Let's draw a line between bank and check balance. Similarly, when a customer wants to transfer funds or make a payment, the bank is going to follow through with those transactions. We don't need to draw a line to log in because that process happens within the banking app. There's no need for the bank to actually get involved with the login process. There are three other types of relationships in addition to association. There's include, extend, and generalization. Let's build out this diagram with additional use cases in order to explain these types of relationships. When a customer types in their login information, our banking app is going to verify the password before completing the login process. But if the password is incorrect, the banking app is going to display an error message. So let's create two new use cases for verify password and display login error. When a customer wants to transfer funds or make a payment, our banking app is going to make sure there's enough money to complete those transactions. So we'll also create another use case called verify sufficient funds. And finally, when a customer wants to make a payment, our banking app is going to give them the option of paying from either their checking account or their savings account. So we'll create two more use cases called pay from checking and pay from savings. Let's circle back to this verified password use case and talk about relationships again. How does verified password relate to the rest of the diagram? Neither of our actors are directly initiating this action. It's just immediately going to happen within our banking app every time there's an attempt to log in. This is an include relationship. An include relationship shows dependency between a base use case and an included use case. Every time the base use case is executed, 
the included use case is executed as well. Another way to think of it is that the base use case requires an included use case in order to be complete. When you have an include relationship, you draw a dashed line with an arrow that points towards the included use case. So in our example, login is the base use case and verified password is the included use case. Every time a customer logs in, our banking app will automatically verify password. This login use case won't be complete unless verified password is complete. So we draw a dashed line with the arrow pointing towards the included use case, and we write include in double chevrons. The next type of relationship is the extend relationship. An extend relationship has a base use case and an extend use case. When the base use case is executed, the extend use case will happen sometimes, but not every time. The extend use case will only happen if certain criteria are met. Another way to think of it is that you have the option to extend the behavior of the base use case. When you have an extend relationship, you draw a dashed line with an arrow that points towards the base use case. In our example, login is a base use case and display login error is an extended use case. Our banking app won't display a login error message every time a customer logs in. This will only happen once in a while when a customer accidentally enters an incorrect password. Since this is an extend relationship, we draw a dashed line with an arrow that points to the base use case and write extend between double chevrons. Hopefully, this thoroughly explains the difference between include and extend relationships. But just in case, here's a very basic example to help differentiate between the two. If you sneeze, you will close your eyes. That's an included relationship because it's going to happen every time. Additionally, if you sneeze, you might say excuse me. That's an extended relationship because it supplements the sneeze, but isn't completely necessary in the sneezing process. Just remember that include happens every time, extend happens just sometimes, and don't forget that the arrows point in opposite directions. One quick thing to note is that multiple base use cases can point to the same included or extended use case. For example, both transfer funds and make payment are going to point to verify sufficient funds as an included use case. We want our banking app to make this check every time either of these base use cases occur. You don't need to duplicate the verify sufficient funds use case. The simpler your diagram, the better. The last type of relationship we'll discuss is generalization, also known as inheritance. When you make a payment from our banking app, you can do so from either your checking account or your savings account. In this scenario, make a payment is a general use case and pay from savings and pay from checking are specialized use cases. You could also use the terms parent and children. Each child shares the common behaviors of the parent, but each child adds something more on its own. To show that this is a generalization, we draw this type of arrow from the children up to the parent. You can have generalizations on use cases like we have here. You can also have generalizations with actors. In certain scenarios, you might want to distinguish between a new customer and a returning customer. You can make them both children to a general customer actor, which would allow you to have certain behaviors or qualities unique to each of these children. One last shape that we'll quickly talk about is a use case with extension points. You can see an example here. The name of the use case is above the line, and then there are extension points below the line. Extension points are just a detailed version of extend relationships. This use case shows that a customer can set up their profile in our banking app. And then these extension points show us that when a customer is setting up their profile, they'll have the option to navigate to a couple different screens. If a customer is confused, they can go to profile help. And if they want details regarding their private information, they can go to privacy info. Those extension points branch off to extended use cases. Go to profile help and show privacy info. We can even add a note to show what sort of conditions would lead to these extension points. Now we have a complete use case diagram with various elements that help explain what our banking app does. This is a very basic example, but remember that even complex systems should be restricted to a simplistic visualization of functionality, behavior, and relationships. If you'd like to take a closer look at this example, click on the card in the upper right hand corner. You'll find this exact banking app example plus several other examples and resources. 
Thanks for watching this tutorial on UML use case diagrams. Please subscribe to our channel to see more helpful tutorials. So, uh, you know, I, I really like this, uh, the way she explains each and everything within a few minutes, right? So that's why uh, it makes use case diagram really simple. And believe me, this is a, one of the most important tool for vision interpretation. So whenever you are in, interpreting any vision of any anybody, now even scientists use use case diagramming up to a great level. You know, all those uh, universities, they have made use case diagramming as an default practice for all their research projects and everything. So learning use case diagram is going to help you throughout your life. And of course, BA, uh, project management, architecting, even depicting the vision of a project owner or being act as a project owner, those kind of scenario. Okay, I'll share this video with you. And as we discussed, uh, there are two homeworks. One homework, draw an activity diagram of an employee registering his attendance at a given office or and draw a use case diagram with an employee at a, registering his attendance. Try yourself so you'll understand how these tools are used. Act use case diagram is a necessary tool for every BA in the world, believe me, or every thinker in the world as we think, right? How to improve, how to make our tea or how to make the process of making tea in the morning easier making coffee in the morning easier. You can depict a use case diagram, which will help you throughout your life, which will make your life more efficient, more easy. Do you require a coffee machine? Is there, will that help you? Do you require a tea maker or you know a boiler pot like we get in electrical boiler, boiler pot available on Amazon and everything? Should we get that one so that my tea will be cooked very faster? Depends on the way you want to cook your tea. Do it depends on the way you want to prepare your tea, right? So similarly, Learning use case diagram really make your life more efficient, more easier, right? And then we're going to step out, uh, you know, and try to understand, as I told you, there are a couple of, you know, tools available to draw use case diagram. You can draw it with pen and paper, as simple as that. Just click the photo and share it on a group. Or you can use something like Lucid Chat, take a print screen and share it on a group. Or you can use something like, uh, you know, uh, Google's uh, UML tool, which is not really matured, but you can try by yourself. It's available in a juice, G Suite. It's called UML use case diagram. And you know, you can click on there and try to use that thing as a normal uh, various tools available for a Google. Okay. Next time you want to uh, discuss uh, these use case uh, in, in a bit detail or a little, let's go through it. Uh, here, the use case uh, depicts a kind of order summary as we've seen before, right? That food order summary. So a waiter comes to you whenever you sit around a table and ask, uh, you know, to order a food. Which orders, if you want to order, you are, you're you're going to decide if you want to order wine or not order wine, depending on the shape, uh, you normally order the food. Food ordering is a necessity because you're going to uh, eat the food there. Then the waiter will serve the food after, uh, you know, um, cooking the food. Then with serve food if you order the wine the wine will also be served to you after the food is served you normally eat the food and if you order the wine you drink the wine if the wine is served or you order the wine and then you pay for the food pay for the wine if you order the you know wine something like that and that rectangular box depicts the system functionality the waiter is outside the system client is outside the system cashier is outside the system even the chef is outside the system Client here is a prime actor. Normally, I prepare one prime actor at a time, but this is a complex, so I can include, uh, sorry, this is a, one of the simplest diagram, so I can include three actors where I normally write prime uh, just below the client use case name. Okay, this thing do happens. Let's try to understand what's the importance of a use case. Use case, the tool have been evolved for last 20 plus year. 23 to be precise, okay? I was involved with Grady Boot, one of the forefathers of use case when I was working with St. Louis with OMG. Now use case diagramming tool is owned and patented by IBM, right? But previously it was a separate entity called Object Method and Group, OMG. That's what we used to call them. You can remember it from, um, oh my God, kind of scenario, right? So there we define the use case uh, symbols for how to depict this architectural thought process the visual thought process 
in a set of you you know standardized symbol set and that's why it's really great you can depict as simple as uh, uh, as simple process as taking uh, making tea making coffee or dropping your kid to the school or something like that set and try to improve your process day by day that's the main intention right it's an easy means to of capturing any uh, the functional requirement um, with a focus on a value added user use cases are relatively easy to write and read compared to the additional requirements methods use case force developer to think from the end user perspective because these are actor driven scenario right you are starting the process with the actor so every human intention every the way user will use the system can be depicted in a user's diagram use case engage the user in a requirement process and that's why ba uses this requirement uh, uh, detailing process the use case diagram is used in detailing the requirement uh, to a great level where we can include uh, the exceptions the scenarios and various priorities as well okay let's stop here today it's almost 11 o'clock for you so you know um, i believe you got enough information enough uh, thinking to do throughout the you know our next session and try to build these two uh, try to complete these two homework activity diagram and use case diagram for a employee registering his attendance right i'll mention it in my you know minutes of meeting which i share uh, after each and every training in a few minutes or uh, and then you can take it from there okay so next session will be on uh, uh, do you have any questions uh, or you know any doubts for me to ask as of now anybody have any confusion no thank you good right and if if you still have you can whatsapp me and i'll be happy to you know address those things right uh, our next session will be on uh, tuesday right no uh, uh, yeah monday 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 you use time you use time monday with me so we'll have our next session on 21st oh, sorry 20th yes so it's my 21st morning no problem so let's so see you there and Thank please you. spend some time uh, try to you know you can do your diagrams with pen and paper you can use some tools like lucid chat which are free of cost but yes they will uh, you know need you register with your name email address and all those things but i believe that's not a big deal right so you can do like that chalo then thanks Thank thanks you. for your patience thanks for your time and if you have any questions please feel free to ask uh, on a whatsapp and i'll be happy to reply you back okay Take Thank care. You. Have a great weekend. You too. And Thank meet you. again on Monday morning, uh, Monday evening, nine p.m. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Have a great night. Have a great weekend. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah.